friends we're continuing on our study through 1st Samuel and today we're looking at 1st Samuel chapter 15 this chapter starts out um, with a setup in a way um, it's in my Bible the paragraph or the chapter heading says the Lord rejects Saul as king so you've got an idea already what's going to happen but we start off with God giving some pretty explicit instructions to Saul. So let's begin chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. I want to pause there for a moment because lots of people read something like that and they get really upset. How is it that God can order the destruction of a whole group of people. This is genocide, isn't it? And I want to clarify, this is actually describing a centuries-old debt against the Amalekites. It, we read about it in Exodus 17, 8 through 16, as well as, again, an injunction from the Lord to Joshua in Deuteronomy 24, 17 to 19 where he says, don't forget what these Amalekites did to the Israelites. Well, what did they do? Well, they blocked the Israelites from escaping Egypt. And as um, in the first um, portion of Scripture, Exodus 17, it's describing the, the consequence, the, the fight that God instructed Moses to have over the Amalekites. They actually would... Um, wait for people who were in the group of the Israelites leaving Egypt and um, attack and plunder those who were lagging behind. So the weak or the, the ones who were straggling a little bit, they would go for them. It was a very cowardly act and had no honor and no respect at all for the fact that this is a group of people that God was leading to their promised land to their land of redemption and God said these people have been opposition and um, attacking us in violent ways for too many years don't forget we need to have some payback um, Moses then was ordered to have a battle against the Amalekites and you may recall during this battle when um, Moses was supposed to keep his staff raised up over his head as a sign of God's authority and God's victory. Um, and when he kept his arm up, the battle was going in their favor. And when he got tired and his arms were lagging, um, the Amalekites were winning. And so Aaron and Hur went up the mountain to hold up Moses' arms so that the the battle victory could be secured and later as they were encroaching on the land of promise and surveying it um, God gave the land of or the Joshua who was to become the leader that succeeded Moses these explicit instructions do not forget that there is still some work to be done here among the Amalekites I have I want to blot out the name of Amalek and have determined them for defeat. But the time had not yet come. And so here it was, the time had come. Um, in Genesis 15 also, God is describing different um, Canaanites at this time. In chapter 15, verse 16, he says, the sin of the Amorites had not reached its full measure. What impresses me about this 
despite the fact that we're reading here where God is saying it's time for judgment on these people, he had waited patiently, hundreds of years even, and they continued to show no respect and no regard for the Lord. And they continue to stand in violent opposition to the people of God. What does this have to do with our lives today? So, of course, we're not going to be participants, I hope, in any genocide. But when it comes to our lives, I liken this process of coming out of Egypt to our own journey out of a sinful life, a life of bondage to sin, and instead into a life of following Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 13 states, Now these things, these stories that we read about in the Old Testament, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. We all face these kind of battles. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you may endure it. There may be, for each one of us, some relationships or patterns of behavior that attach us or secure us, and actually violently maybe, in, in terms of our spiritual wellness, or steadfastly impede us or oppose us or oppose the work of God, rather, in the work that He wants to do in our lives. And so we need to be clear about the destruction, the removal of ourselves from this. You see, the Canaanites were known for despicable worship practices, including child sacrifice, including um, ritual prostitution, and things that did not honor God or God's people in any way. And as we come out of our life of sin, I believe there is the necessity for us, really, to make a very clear distinction and separation, maybe from certain behaviors or relationships in our lives that may impede or oppose the work of God that he wants to do in each one of us. So for our table talk right now, would you take just a couple minutes and talk to one another? Maybe you want to have a chance to think through or talk through with a couple of people about some of those areas that Maybe the Holy Spirit is pinpointing in your life right now. And how important is it that we allow the Holy Spirit to do some spiritual surgery in our life? This removal of the Canaanites was really kind of like taking out the gangrene from some uh, spiritual rot that needed, that was settling in, and it was going to damage and destroy all of them if they didn't have this surgery. How, how important is it that we allow God's Spirit to do that same work in our lives? Could you talk about that for a couple minutes, please? Welcome back. So we'll continue on this chapter in verse 4. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. And then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites. That, um, sorry, so that I do not destroy you along with them, for you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites, and then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep 
and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. And then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel and there he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, huh, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Oh, tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Oh, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Oh, wow. As a young girl, I remember visiting the Royal London Wax Museum in Victoria. I was really intrigued to see the replicas of the people who cannot see back or hear what you're saying. Um, they looked real enough, and it was kind of cool to think, wow, that's what that person looks like. And sometimes we actually imagined their eyes were following us across the room. Here, Saul is waxing eloquently. And maybe it's a bit of a reach, but I like the idea of thinking about these wax figures when I think of Saul. Because it looks good, sounds good, but it's not real. And at first glance, you might think, oh, wow, that's, you know, Queen Elizabeth right there. There's, you know, who is it? Who, you know, I can't remember all the characters. There were many. But there was nothing of genuine substance inside. This is a rather sad conversation between Saul and Samuel, and it reveals a number of behaviors exhibited by, by Saul that shows why God found Saul's leadership so regrettable. In the recovery houses where I work, we talk about owning up to our wrong and taking responsibility and how important that is. And we talk about how dangerous it is when we are participating in these five things. Denial, blame, excusing, justifying, minimizing. All of these are 
foolish and selfish attempts to assage our guilt, to appease our pride and cover up our wrong. And Saul, in this conversation with Samuel, is participating in all of these to his demise. In verse 12, we read about his pride on display when he sets up a monument in his own honor. Remember when I talked earlier about Saul's surprise party and he's announced, it's announced to him, you're going to be king. And he has this very humble opinion of himself. Ooh, me? I can't be the guy. I'm from the, I'm insignificant in my tribe, from an insignificant tribe. And here he, we find him setting up a monument in his own honor because of this victory over the Amalekites. In verse 13, we see him denying, flat out denying, where Saul, uh, Samuel confronts him and, and he just says, oh, but I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And in Samuel responds, well, then what is that bleeding of sheep in my ears? And Saul goes into blame. The soldiers brought them. And then he says in justification for what the soldiers did, to sacrifice to the Lord. And then minimizing what he actually did by saying, oh, we totally destroyed the rest. Minimizing that he was not obedient. And Samuel again confronts him with truth. Well, why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil? And in verses 20 and 21, Saul replies again with a repeat, deny, excuse, blame, justify, saying, I did obey. I completely destroyed. The soldiers took to sacrifice. Again, repeating his attempt to cover up, Samuel responds again, Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Last week, Doug spoke about how Saul was actually very religious. And we see that here again, that this religiosity is at the heart of what Samuel is trying to get at in this confrontation with Saul as well. Samuel describes religiosity as divination. And he says, rebellion is like the sin of divination. What is divination? Well, it's trying to gain knowledge of God or the supernatural through the use of indicators without specific input from God. There's no actual relationship. It's not authentic. It has a big veneer of wax all over it in this relationship that Saul has with God. Even saying to Samuel, the Lord your God, not the Lord my God. Saul actually ends up doing later real divination by going and seeing the witch of Endor. And we'll read about that in another few weeks. And then it talks about, he uh, Samuel mentions the arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Idolatry is what Adam and Eve participated in in the first sin in the Garden of Eden. There was a question brought to mind as to whether God might be holding out some good information that I need to know to get the upper hand. They thought, they questioned, does God really know what's best for me? Maybe I should take matters into my own hand. And idolatry is basically putting in God's place anyone or anything instead of God. Teraphim idols were used in those days to manipulate and coerce the gods to action. And in Saul's behavior, he sees God as someone he can control or manipulate to get what he wants. Well, I'll just appease him with the sacrifices in order to get the inside track or force a course of action while dismissing the obvious obedience. Hebrews 10, 1 to 25 goes into detail describing how God is not pleased with sacrifices, but that Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice, came 
to do one thing, the will of God, to follow in obedience, in verses 8 and 9. And then it says, we need to draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings, in verse 20, verse 22. I like that word, the sincere heart. It is similar to the word authentic, right? Sincere actually means, kind of cool here, and this is where my wax museum little metaphor comes into play. Sincere means without wax, not all polished up and fake, not just made to look on the outside like something that's genuine. No, sincere is genuine, through and through. There's no wax, no pretense, nothing fake here. In recovery circles, we speak of this as being rigorously authentic, that we are being honest about every little detail. And this is what's going to keep us from following, falling into prideful deceit and covering up our wrongdoing. It, it helps us to take responsibility where we need to. Doug and I often re, uh, watch or take a look at the website called despair.com and we saw a humorous look at these motivational posters and this one that we sometimes quote on occasion just for a laugh. It's called Blame and it says the secret of success is knowing who to blame for your failures. <laughs> I like that. So how difficult, let's, let's just take a minute and reflect in a table talk. How difficult is it for you? Or, yeah, it's hard for me too. To live really sincerely, authentically, without denying or blaming or excusing or justifying or minimizing. Can you talk for a few minutes about that? Okay, well, let's take a look at some more scriptures. Start back in verse 24. And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. And Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Oh, Saul, he is still trying to get Samuel to help him to save face, even in his repentance, in front of the people. And even in here, verse 31, where it says, Saul worshiped the Lord, it was, it was to look good in front of the people. Please honor me before the elders of my people. Let's contrast this to David's sin. I mean, we know later, we'll read this again, passage where David sinned. I mean, he was the one that God used to replace this king, Saul. But David wasn't perfect, and he sinned in adultery and then a murder to cover up the adultery. And when Nathan confronts David, we read David's confession in Psalm 51. I encourage you, when you have a few minutes, go ahead and read that psalm. It's a, a beautiful, authentic, heartfelt reply in response to being confronted with his sin. 
and think about that in contrast to Saul's reply. Oh, I got caught. Uh, help me cover it up. Right? David doesn't do that. And especially in verse 16 and 17 in Psalm 51, where he says, to God, not to Samuel's God, he says, God, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Or another version says, you will never turn away. Humble repentance is a recognition of who God is and a sincere, honest, without wax desire to follow his way and not to manipulate God to do it my way. In verse 32, Samuel says, huh, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so your will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. That word regretted is interesting. Does it mean that God didn't know or was taken aback or surprised by Saul's actions? I don't think so, and we know that God is all-knowing, and he knows the future. He's not shocked. And does God change his mind then? And we look in verse 29 where it said, we said earlier, no, God is not a man that he would change his mind. And Numbers 23, 19, it says, God is not human that he should lie, and not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? But then why... Do we see this whole little passage about God's regret? Let's take a look at Jeremiah 8, 18, 7 through 10. I didn't pre-find this, so hang on for just a second while I locate it. Here we go. It's about the potter. God's describing, or Jeremiah's um, in conversation with God, and this imagery of the potter comes to the forefront in verses 7 to 10. If, I, if at any time I announce, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, that I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent, and I will not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. I like this. It's quite fascinating and interesting that God, the creator of the universe, he is faithful to follow through. There is something here that he is not going to not do, and that's um, bring judgment on sin and reward for good. God is on the side of good all the time. It is, though, a relationship that God invites us into, and some of the promises that God makes are conditional on our response. And here we read this if-then process a number of times. If the people repent, then I will not bring the judgment. If they continue to do evil, then judgment will come. The most quoted verses from the Old Testament found in the New Testament that is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
John and Acts most quoted is Isaiah verse 6, 9 through 10. It says, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. God desires a real relationship with worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. Without Wax, the genuine article. I am so grateful, friends, that we can bring to God our brokenness. We can come to God with a contrite heart, and we know God is faithful to do his part. He will receive us with his cleansing forgiveness. David knew that. He said, a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will never turn away. God's grace and his mercy and his love for us is in place. It's been in place from the beginning through all of these relationships with people in the Old Testament and continues through the work of Jesus Christ extended to anyone who will receive and be filled to the full with his life-giving water. Praise be to Jesus. Pray for one another.